Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. And we're here with two great representatives from Pressbooks. We have Amy Song, who's a customer service manager, Jocelyn Jones, which is community manager and support specialist. And they're here to tell you how to use Pressbooks to create your next OER. Thank you both for coming. Thank you so much, Tracy and Brad, for having us. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining this session. My name is Amy. I'm the Customer Success Manager at Pressbooks, and I'm joined by my colleague, Jocelyn. Um, Jocelyn, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. It's so nice to meet you all. I'm the Community Manager here at Pressbooks. And just a little disclaimer, my neighbors are doing construction now. So if you hear any crazy noise, just send me a chat, and, and I'll try to uh, mute myself. <laughs> Great, thanks so much, Jocelyn. Um, and great to see you, Jamie, and uh, some other people who I've met here before. Um, thank you, like I said, for coming. Today's session is going to be about how to use Pressbooks to create your next OER. I saw here yesterday that there was another presentation about Pressbooks. You've done a presentation about H5P, so you're in really good hands here to learn all about how you could get the most out of your Pressbooks um, agreement if your institution uses Pressbooks, or uh, it's a great way to find out one of the many platforms that you can use to create your next uh, open educational resource. So today I'm going to do a little, now that I've done a little bit of an introduction, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. So um, we're going to go through the Pressbooks directory, how to get started on your project. I'll walk you through a little bit of the platform and then at the end there will hopefully be a little bit of time for questions. I think Brad said this was 50 minutes, so we'll try to let you go at 2.50. Well, hopefully we do let you go at 2.50 uh, and hopefully we'll cover all the things that are of interest to you. Um, I am going to share my screen just for a brief moment so that I can show you uh, the things that might be interesting to you. So this is the Oklahoma Press Network. Uh, there are many of you who are uh, who are on this network currently. Um, if you're a part of, let me read out the institutions, Murray State, Connor State, Northeastern University, Tulsa Community College, Cameron University, Western Oklahoma State College, <laughs> or East Central slash Rudlands. Um, I, I believe those are the institutions who are using Pressbooks. So if you're using one of, if, if you are a part of one of those institutions uh, and you uh, have never heard of Pressbooks before, or you haven't used Pressbooks, um, I would recommend that you talk to Brad or to Tacey and see um, how you can get access to those. I believe that down here, there's actually a steering committee of, of, of the people who are sort of in touch there. Um, Awesome. And Brad, thank you for confirming that. Each uh, each of the institutions I, I read out the names to, there are point people who are responsible for managing your Pressbooks networks. I do not believe that this is the exact list. I know Jamie is, is the touch person, uh, the point person for Tulsa, but um, I know that these names are some sometimes correct and sometimes not actually aligned. Uh, so if you do want confirmation on that, I would, <laughs> not to volunteer Brad and Tracy, but go to them for help. If you are not a part of those institutions or you're from out of state and you're interested in Pressbooks, um, get in contact with us and we would be happy to help. If you're a part of Oklahoma, I would actually still recommend that you get in touch with Brad or Tracy as they will be able to help you. If you're from out of state, you're welcome to reach out to us and we would be happy to let you know where to go to um, to start Pressbooks or how to get started. There's a couple of other things that I want uh, to tell you about that I think will be really important. Um, firstly is the Pressbooks webinars. So we do something like this every single month that's live. Um, I have historically done them, but Jocelyn's actually taking them over for me starting uh, next week. So uh, you can see November 9th, um, actually in two weeks, I suppose. Um, those, will, those are ongoing always, and they're free for everyone to register to. So if you are leaving for whatever reason today, you can register for, to those for free. We also have a YouTube channel where we have a variety of different videos from product update meetings to short Pressbooks videos um, that are five minutes in length. So if you really want like the real deal very quickly, then you can find those on our YouTube channel. And lastly, we have a Pressbooks user guide. Everything that we cover here today and far beyond will be a part of this guide. So if you are looking to get a refresher on how to clone a book or how to add an image, all of that will be found on here. So between these three resources that you, you sort of cover all of the bases. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about that. Um, can I get a raise of hands just to see uh, who does not know what Pressbooks is or who is new to Pressbooks? Okay. 
Okay, so there are two people who are completely new to Pressbooks. So just to make sure that we are as inclusive as possible, I want to tell you that Pressbooks is a, just because I do get this question sometimes where people say, what is Pressbooks? Pressbooks is a publishing platform where you can create content uh, and you can write your content in one single place and then you can export it into a web version a pdf or an epub to then share with your readers probably your students um so today we're going to be walking through how to create that that sort of start with that book so that is a little bit of a basic introduction into press books and now i'm going to hand it over to jocelyn to get started with the session all right can you guys see my screen right here? <laughs> Just checking. Okay, perfect. All right, so right now we are looking at the Pressbooks directory. Uh, this page um, features a tour at the very top. So if you are, if you ever do land here and you're a little bit confused, you can always go ahead and take the tour. Um, it's, it's pretty thorough, I have to admit. So um, this is where all the open, um, open licensed books that live on Pressbooks um, will live and that you can um, access. So if you are looking for a place to get started with your resource and you're not really sure, you can always browse the open collection, which is such a great resource for you to have. So this is just pressbooks.directory. So you can go ahead and scroll down and you can see 4,824 books. And that, that is admittedly a lot to go through. So you can always filter by subject and you can filter by um, institution. So if you want to see where or what uh, other institutions are publishing or what they're putting out, you can also look through languages. So if um, you want to find French resources, you can. Um, and then you can also see if other people are putting H5P um, elements into their textbooks, which is really, really fun. So um, if I am an instructor and I'm going to be hosting um, a workshop on maybe writing, I'm going to check out to see what other type of um, resources of writing I can find on Pressbooks. And I really like this academic writing one. So I can actually go ahead and read this right on the web, or I can go ahead and download it. So I can get a print PDF and XML file. So it's, it's pretty um, vast, the types of um, access you have to these materials, which I think is really great. And then you can go ahead and read it. Um, and, and it looks just beautiful. So um, after that, sorry, my, my share screen bar is right where I need to click right now. So that's very helpful. Um, one second. Um, bear with me, so sorry. <laughs> okay, so I really like this book for my resource and I want to bring it onto my Pressbooks um, network. So there is a pretty easy way that we can do that. Um, whoops. Just gonna have this just stop sharing for a second. Sorry, guys. Okay. There we go. All right, so this is my um, network dashboard. And if I go to my books, I can notice the ones that I have and I have an option to create a book or I also have an option to clone a book. And this is where I'm going to go if I want to bring this academic writing book onto my network so that my students can read it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the URL and I'm going to put it right into that bar there. And then I'm going to create a new URL. So if you notice, um, this will be your institution, this part of the URL, .pressbooks.pub slash, and then I'm going to give it a title. So I'm just going to give it the same title that it already has. And then I'm just going to leave this part blank here so that the title of the book remains the same because I don't want to change it. So I, I would click uh, clone this book, but this process can take anywhere between two to 10 minutes, depending on the size of the book. So I've done this in advance um, just for time's sake. So here it is in my collection, in my books. And from here, I actually have the option to edit it however I see fit, which is so helpful. Um, if I see a chapter that I don't think that my students are going to benefit from, I can, I can actually just go to organize and I can completely just remove it. So if I don't think that my students will benefit from breaking down an assignment, I can just click on trash and it will be gone from the copy. And then I can also um, restore that as well, um, which is very helpful. Okay, I'm going to have to stop sharing again. <laughs> 
just so I can get my other copy here. And I just want to hop in to say here that this can be done to any book. So any book that is openly licensed on the directory, all books on the directory are free to read. Uh, so even if you don't, or if, even if your institution isn't using Pressbooks, for example, you can still use that book for your class. It's just you won't be able to, let's say, adapt that book, but you can absolutely still use it. And if you have a Pressbooks account, then you can do the process that Jocelyn just showed and clone that book. So there's a lot of options for, for use and for reuse here. That's right. All right, so now I'm gonna show you this really interesting tool that Pressbooks has called Import. So as I'm looking through this resource, I'm noticing that there are so many great chapters, but there is something missing that I've noticed that um, another book actually has. So I can hop into another book, um, say Building Blocks of Academic Writing, and this book actually has a chapter on um, the introduction, the body, the conclusion, handling evidence. Um, and I really want to put that into this resource. So I can actually go ahead and go to import and select import from uh, URL. And then I can copy and paste the URL into this. And then oh, I Jocelyn, can... I think you grabbed the link of the directory. Oh. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Um, and then I can import it right into my book. So again, oh, um, I think, I think um, you, you had selected the XML. So if you want to just click on that and then go to the, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Um, yeah, so um, I actually did this in advance as well. Um, but just because again, this is, um, a process that can take a little bit of time just because I, I think I did select quite a big book, but then here we are. You can actually select um, what you want to bring into your book from that, the imported book. And then um, say if I want to import this last section, um, I can click import and then it will be brought right into my book beautifully. And, and that's that. So, um, So there it is. There's that beautiful, and it, and it brings over all the metadata from the book as well. So you don't have to worry about crediting or anything like that, which is very useful. So that is the directory, uh, cloning a book and importing a book. But what happens if you wanna just start from scratch? So you can go ahead and go to my books and then create a book. So this is the create a book page on Pressbooks. And again, with the URL, you just want to decide where um, your book wants to live on the website. So I want to call my book test book two, because I already have test book one. And th this is an interesting point. Um, you actually can't um, change the URL of the book unless you're the network manager. So if you are creating the URL for the book, you just want to make sure it's descriptive yet um, you know, something that you are comfortable with it um, staying the same forever, um, unless you go through the, the network manager to change it. So I'm going to call this my test. Thank you. And then um, this uh, privacy aspect, um, it just lets us know if you want it to be private or public. I'm going to leave it uh, public for now. <laughs> and then I'm just going to click create. Oh, it already exists. Okay. So Great. So then you just go to my books. And then I'm going to go to my test book too and visit admin. And here is the shell of my book. So I'm on my books dashboard and now it is completely mine to artfully approach or, um, you know, import data from other places or create H5P elements or do anything that I'm interested in, in um, creating. So you can change your, your title page, um, anything like that. So um, maybe Amy, should I, I leave it over to you? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you so much, Jocelyn. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Anybody at all? 
Uh, is the creator of the item notified when someone uses their material? Unfortunately, no. This is something that we're hoping we can achieve sometime in the future. Um, for example, if your book, uh, no, I, I would say I would say in general, no. Um, we just haven't had the. Uh, it, it's it, it hasn't been something that we have worked on historically, but there is a greater and greater interest for it. Um, there is no uh, sort of. I don't want to say legal, but there's no stipulation to do so because these works are op if your work is openly licensed and someone is reusing it, then they 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 are able to do so without n notifying the original author. So so that's um, that's why it hasn't been a priority for us. But I think obviously uh, we try to do what our clients and users want most. So hopefully that's something that we can do in the future. Thanks. Uh, does oh yes within your the book that you created it within the book that you created did you list the author of the material uh yes yeah. so um actually let me show you uh jocelyn actually do you want to pull up the book do you want to show your screen to show the um the uh, book, book that you cloned sure i cloned this one Oh, sorry. J just on on university. Oh. Just. Oops. Here it is. Uh, there we go. So actually, if you go to the if you go to visit the book, uh, just go to hover over academic writing basics, and then just the book. There we go. Sorry, it wasn't very description. <laughs> it wasn't very descriptive there. Uh, if you slide all the way down. Um, you see that there's a book source right there? That book source automatically comes over when someone clones a book. So this no, an author cannot remove this message. Um, no matter how hard you try, you will not be able to remove this message. So even though the original author is not notified, it is automatically attributed. And we built that in so that there's no confusion about you know stealing any sort of work. And you saw that from when Jocelyn did the example about um, importing that chapter from the other, like the version of history chapter from the other book, you saw that the author was automatically attributed as well. So she was saying that the, the metadata and the author has been brought in successfully. Hopefully that sort of provides <laughs> greater clarification on how that works. Yes, it does. Thank you. Great, yeah, and um, and as Jamie is saying, uh, that that is a very common practice, especially for well-established open educational resources. Um, to note that if you want to reuse the book, like oftentimes authors will have a link to a Google form that has you know three questions about where you know what's your name, where which institution are you from, and why are you looking to reuse this book. So that that might also be a really great way to um, sort of engage with uh, people who might be interested in, in, in using that book. So those are some really great questions. And um, the last thing I wanted to mention about um, Jocelyn's demo is that uh, as you saw in her demonstration, all of those methods can be used at once. So it's not like you have to just use a clone or just use uh, you know a brand new created book or just use um, you know your manuscript that you've imported from Word. You can combine all of those different techniques at once. Um, and that's probably the nicest part about OER. It's that so long as you have the permissions to do so, so as long as it's not all rights reserved or no derivatives, you're able to sort of have creative and pedagogical freedom with how you want to curate your text. So um, thank you so much, Jocelyn, for giving that short demonstration. Excellent. So now I am going to finish off the rest of the demonstration by showing you how to sort of navigate your way around Pressbooks, because while Jocelyn did an excellent job of presenting about how to bring content in, I wanted to talk a little bit more about how to um, uh, uh, create that content within the chapters um, themselves. So if we go back into the test book that Jocelyn had created, there are a bunch of things on the left-hand side that you're going to be spending the majority of your time on. 
So actually where you'll be spending the most amount of your time is in the organized module where uh, most of the creation happens. And what's so nice about Pressbooks is that what you see is what you get and you can always make edits to your book. So there's no, you know, it's not like the 1950s where you, you know, wrote something down and then you send it to the editor and then the editor would look over it and then you get, you get it back and then you do your, you do more edits. It's like you, you know, make your edits, you preview your book, you can see exactly how it's going to look to your students and then you can continue to edit to your liking. So that is a that's a really nice part about working on Pressbooks, just because you don't you know you own your content we don't own it you own it and you know <laughs> like your content is yours and you can you know always edit or or or, or fix or delete to your liking so from here i'm actually going to hop into a chapter so that i can show you what this looks like so you'll see that on here there is what is called a visual editor and a text editor I would say for the 99% of you in this room, the visual editor will suffice. But if you are a whiz for some reason and you love typing in HTML, go for it. But I would say broadly to use the visual editor, it's, it's really great. Um, and here, let's just say that I am looking to get started with my chapter. Uh, there are headings down here. And I'm going to say, this is my first heading. So you can see that there is many different headings. We would obviously recommend that you use them sequentially for accessibility purposes. And let's say that I type in a sentence. So I will say, Montreal is experiencing unusually warm weather for October. We had highs of 25 degrees the other day, which I'm not sure what that is in Fahrenheit, but that is extraordinarily warm for Canada <laughs> in October. Um, and let's say that from here, I wanted to add a footnote. What I can do is just drop my cursor as it's as you can see it's blinking and I'm just going to click on footnote which I am not oh where did that to go there we go so there's this little put paper clip button I'm going to it you won't be able to see this on my screen share because it's uh it's it's a browser pop-up but on my browser it says uh footnote content enter your footnote content in here so I'm going to say this is purely based on personal experience. So, um, so a not very credible footnote, but there you go. I've inserted my footnote and uh, I'm going to also then create a glossary term so I can show you how that's done. Instead of dropping your cursor like you did for a footnote, obviously for a term, you need to highlight that term. So I've highlighted um, the city I live in and I'm going to insert a uh, glossary term here. And you will be able to see this because this is a pop-up in Pressbooks. And you can see my term is there. And I'm going to say description, the most populous city in the province. I'm going to click insert. And you will see that now there's a short code around Montreal. And it, it will perfectly create a glossary term. Um, and I will show you what that looks like in a moment. And what's so great about this glossary feature is that if you decide to include another glossary term later or that I'm going to repeat Montreal and I want to insert the glossary term again, then you can choose from your list of existing glossary terms. So you won't have to re-enter them every time. So those are a uh, so those are a couple of different um, things that I wanted to show you in terms of the inline text material. Um, there's some other features that might be of interest to you, uh, including LaTeX. So if you'd like to use math, if you're a STEM instructor, even if you're not a STEM instructor, if you like LaTeX, uh, then you can um, insert math very easily. You just have to click on this and you'll get a similar text box to the one that I was talking about when I was speaking on footnotes. It's a browser pop-up. And all I'm going to do is type in very simply the Pythagorean theorem. And you'll see that my math, I just typed in this and it's automatically surrounded in the law text formatting. So all of this looks a little bit weird right now, but I promise when you go to preview your content or save your content and view it, it will, the, the, the software will, will, will output the output what you want to see. So that is how you, how quickly you can insert math. You can also draw your reader's eyes by inserting different text boxes. So we offer 
different types of text boxes and different colors. Um, you can change these colors. I won't cover that in this session today, but you can change these colors. These text boxes are also not just for text. You can insert images, um, all the, the math equation, the footnote, the glossary term, all of that can go in the text boxes. If you're familiar with HTML, they're just a regular, what you'd call a div. So if you're familiar with that language, you know that inside of a div, you can put anything within it. It's just a container. So you can put in anything that you'd like into there. Uh, and then some other features that might be of interest to you is adding uh, adding media. So if you wanted to add an image, you just have to go into uh, adding your media. And I've chosen this picture that I took last year. I'm just gonna take a second to load, but here's a picture of a lake. And on the right-hand side, there are a bunch of different uh, fields that you can input. So the first thing up top is the alt text. So obviously very important, um, especially because the alt text is not only read, uh, not only what's printed out if the image does not render for whatever reason, but the alt text actually is really great because Pressbooks web books are compatible with screen readers. So it, for, screen, for those on screen readers, the alt text is what it will read. So that's very crucial. You can include a caption, a description, and you can include all of the attributions. If you did not take the image yourself, I would recommend obviously that you include all this information for the sake of today and for the sake of time. And given the fact that I was the one who took this image, I'm just gonna skip over it. And I can also choose the size of the image that I want to insert. I'm going to insert it into my chapter. And there you go. This beautiful picture of a lake has been brought in perfectly. You can also include things like YouTube videos. So let's say that I go onto our YouTube channel and I want to include this video that uh, we made about um, introduction to Pressbooks. Then what I can do, I, w I know, I wish I could have chosen a more fun video, but this was the one that was most on hand. <laughs> um, and I'm just gonna take the link, copy it, and I'm gonna paste it directly into my browser. Nothing special, just the link of the video itself and paste it in. And you'll see that this will start to play in the browser beautifully. It doesn't distract the reader. They can just continue to watch it as they're reading instead of having to you know, be navigated elsewhere to access that content. So at this point, uh, my very uh, chaotically put together chapter with no rhyme reason or <laughs> particular story has been completed. So at this point, if I wanna see what, how my chapter is looking, all I have to do is go into preview where I will see my chapter in the way that it's being presented to the reader. So you'll see that my heading, my heading one looks great. Um, my glossary term looks excellent. You can see that the exact term that I put in there has been brought in perfectly. You can see that there's a footnote down here that, that is hyperlinked that I can navigate to easily. You can see that the Pythagorean theorem that I put in with LaTeX has been rendered beautifully into a LaTeX equation. We use a very accessible math tool called MathJax. Uh, and then moving further down, that YouTube video like I was talking about will play in browser. That image that I was talking about in great uh, resolution, as well as the text boxes that I was speaking on. So you have a lot of flexibility and freedom to sort of make your book your own, add in whatever content you'd like uh, and, and go from there. Um, and uh, I think that is sort of what I had wanted to talk to you today about including content directly uh, into Pressbooks. Um, does anyone have any questions about anything else I have covered thus far? Yes, please. <laughs> Amy, the, yes. Oh, my phone rang and so I missed how you entered that photo. Um, I think oh, I know yeah. how to do it right. So the resolution is, is high enough, but can you show me one more time? Yeah, absolutely. So that's a really great question actually, because so all you have to do, I'll start from the beginning, um, is you just have to go into add media. Right. And you can either drag the file on here or select a file to upload. And then once it's, once it's uploaded at the very bottom, you can choose the size in which it is brought in. And I think this is the part that really trips people up because sometimes people will choose medium and then they'll try to, you know, extend the image, but you can see that that image looks really blurry. 
So for those of you who are not aware or are new to Pressbooks, Pressbooks is built on top of WordPress. Um, we did that by design because WordPress is such a tool of familiarity for most people. So this is a WordPress default feature where when you upload an image, um, WordPress will automatically create four different sizes of the image. It will create an icon size, a medium size, a large size, which is the one that I have here, and a full size of the image, which depends on the size of the original image that you've uploaded. So all to say, just make sure that you choose the right size of image that you want when you upload the image. Does that make sense, Jamie? It does. And is there any downside to choosing the, the biggest one possible so that? No, 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 no downsides at all, um, especially if you're using Pressbooks through an enterprise agreement, which Tulsa is. Um, that is awesome for you because uh, no, no network has ever reached their maximum upload limit before. So, so awesome. there's no, there's no disadvantage to using a full size image at all. Um, obviously if, if your, if your book is only filled with images, if you had like a thousand images, it might take a second to load, <laughs> but that's, that's the only downside. And obviously having like four or five large images in a chapter is, is no big deal. Awesome. And if I might, one more question. I've done the glossary terms, the way you demoed where you highlight the term yeah. and then you enter it. If you were to, let's say a glossary imported with a, a source book that you've cloned, mm -hmm. um, do those automatically highlight in the chapters? Like, can you do it the opposite way? Like bring the words and the definitions in and then have them activate? Um, so that's a good question. If you have a list of glossary terms, like let's say on a Microsoft Word doc and you try to import that, that's not going to work, unfortunately. But if you're on a press book, on like, let's say you find a book on the directory and you like the glossary term they use for your physics class or whatever. If you import that chapter, your glossary terms will work. So um, I wasn't sure which, if you were asking about another platform or if you're talking about um, a, like a different press book, if, it, if they're glossary terms from a different press book, then yes, they will work. They will automatically link, like it will show you the exact glossary term. Whereas from another platform, that's unfortunately not gonna work. Does that make sense? It does. I, I guess okay. I was thinking about like batch loading glossary terms instead of instead of activating. Oh, um, no, you'd have to bring them. They're associated with the chapter in which the glossary term is located. So you can't just batch import just the glossary term themselves. But that's a really good question, actually. OK, thank you. I appreciate yeah. you. So um, no problem at all. Those are some really great questions. Uh, does anyone have any other questions about the things that I've covered thus far? Awesome. Um, so I know that you just had a session about H5P, so I won't dwell on it for too long, but I did want to tell you where you can find it. So on the left hand side, you'll see that there's a very obvious button here that says, oh, I got to save first. I'm going to come back to this. I want to make sure that this is saved. Um, on the left hand side, you're going to see a button that says H5P content. Um, this is where you add in your H5P content. But if you create a book, there's a chance that you might not see this. Um, depending on your network settings, but fear not, regardless of whether or not it's it's working or not, all you have to do is go into your go into plugins on the left hand side and click uh, activate under H5P. And what that will do is that will activate the H5P plugin in your book. At that point, you should you should see this on the left hand side, and you should be able to get started with your H5P creation. So. And um, we're, 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 we're slightly running out of time. So like I said, um, if you do have questions about explicitly about how to get, how, which H5P activities to use, I'd recommend that you watch the recording for the uh, H5P session that happened today because I know it was far more comprehensive. Um, but here you can see, it just gives me a consent button to make sure that I understand exactly what this consists of. And I just said, yes, I would like to demo this. So please give me the hub. And it's just gonna take some time to load. From here, this should be, if you're familiar with H5P, this should be familiar to you. There are 50 different kinds of activities that you can use. Um, and to really simply get started, um, all I'm going to do is let's say, click on an activity. If I'm curious about the activity, just click on any of them or one that interests you. And it will give you a description, the title, as well as some screenshots of how the activity takes place. And you can also have that activity demoed directly on the h5p.org website. So you can see here, um, known as, oh, blueberries. Let's try that. There you go, woo, it's correct. <laughs> 
I didn't even read it. So I wasn't sure what the right answer was there, but um, I guess it was pretty simple after all. But there's many different kinds of examples that you can try out so that you can see if this is best suited for you. Um, so I'd recommend that if you are not sure if the activity will suit your needs to go actually try the examples out that H5P offers. They're often fun um, and easy to get started with. And if you would like to use them, just click install and it will install that activity library. All that means is it's downloading that activity for you to use it. So from here, you're just going to click install and it's just going to take a second to load. And once this loads, what this will do is it will allow you to be able to use that activity. This is a really great time to go back to the directory actually, because I want to, oh, I don't know why that's not working. I was just, I was um, mentioning this in my last uh, webinar. This is our demo network. So sometimes our developers play with it and, and break it just for just for fun, <laughs> um, purposefully so that we can, that we, while they're testing and making things better. So um, if it's not working on here, please do not panic. This does not accurately reflect what would happen on your end. Um, perhaps we need to move on to demoing on a, on a on a better network here. But let me see if I can find another one that will actually download. This is one that I'm familiar with. And I'm actually going to go back to the directory because this is a uh, this is a really we recently implemented this feature. I see recently, but in the past six months, where on each book card, if there is an H5P activity, uh, at least one, it will give you uh, the number of H5P activities in that book, as well as a hyperlink that will lead you directly to that book's list of H5P activities. And from here, you can click on the activities to see the activities. And if there's a reuse button, you're able to reuse that activity in your book. So there is the option to create a new activity or there's the option to reuse that activity. So it's a really great way, just like how in Pressbooks, you, you know, you can create your entirely new book or you can import different active, uh, different chapters or, you know, bring over, you know, create an entire copy of that book. H5P is no different. You can either choose to create it from scratch or you can import that activity and use it as is or import that activity and edit it to your liking. So from here, I'm going to click use now that my drag the words activity library has been downloaded. Um, you can see that there's a couple of navigational things up here. So if you want a tutorial, like I said, you can click up here and this will give you a very detailed, comprehensive guide on how you can create a, a, a drag the words exercise. Um, one of the really nice parts is that uh, with H5P, and we also use a tool called Hypothesis, all of these organizations are all open source like us, and they sort of have similar mandates and we care about similar things. So they also have, you know, made it really flexible to add your own metadata about this content. They have extensive, um, they have extensive uh, tutorials and documentation on how you can get started. So lots of different ways to help you uh, to determine A, if you want to use this activity at all, um, B, if, if it will do exactly what you want it to do, and C, also obviously how you can use the activity and how you can create the activity. So I won't go through this for the sake of time today, but there are lots of different activities and, and ways to configure. So there is that. Um, and then, like I said, just to create the activity, you just have to create, click add new and then go to create content. Alternatively, as I had mentioned, you can also upload content. So let's say that I actually do go into that book and I really like this activity about, um, you know, that uh, UTSA has created about student writers. Um, oh, did that activity download? Yes, it did. Sorry, Jocelyn, now my Zoom share thing is covering my bottom bar. Um, so from here, I'm just gonna click upload a file and I'm gonna go back into my downloads. So I've uploaded this activity. You can click use. And while it would be incredibly fun for me to <laughs> redo this activity or make some edits for the sake of time, I'm just gonna click create. And what this will do is now create an exact copy of this activity on my book. So 
there you go. You'll see that this activity has been brought in and it looks identical to the one that I was hoping that it would look identical to. So you can see that it's very easy to bring in activities from elsewhere. Um, and, and like I said, if you wanted to take the time to create your own activities, we also encourage that and welcome that as well. From here, what I'm going to do is bring this activity into my book. So that's definitely something that the H5P session did not cover. Um, but now that I have the activity in my book, I'm going to copy this ID on the right hand side. And I'm going to go back into my book where I can insert that ID. Alternatively, you can also click add H5P up here and insert and you have both of those, uh, you can see that they're identical and they will refer to the same activity. So when I go to preview, you'll see that both of the activities, they're the exact same obviously because I ent entered it twice, but you'll see that the activity looks exactly the way I wanted to and I should be able to do the activity and uh, reap the results that I'd like. So, that is a little bit about how you can insert content into Pressbooks. And also we have a revisions tool on the right hand side. So let's say for whatever reason, you don't like the changes you've made. Not only can you see what you've added, you can also see what you've removed. So if for what, and you can see, you can filter them throughout many different versions. Obviously I've only made one edit, but if you make many, you can have you know many, many, many different notches that you can go through and restore the content uh, where necessary. So, that is a little bit about how to include content and how to get started there. Um, I am, before I stop for questions, we're running out of time. So I'm going to actually finish the session before I take any questions. But at this point, you might be thinking, you've shown us how to create the content, but you did not show us what would happen. You know, let's say I go into view my chapter and I just really don't like the typeface or I really don't like the font. Um, how would I fix that? Well, all of that lives under the appearance module. There are 21 different kinds of themes that you can use for your book. And what this will do is this is just the CSS, all to say this will not change the content of the book. It will just fix how the book looks at the top level. So if you, you know, decide to use, and if you're noticing now, this is using, we named all of them after um, authors. <laughs> so let's say I really like the at with theme. Let's say I activate this. This won't, this won't have changed any of the content in my book. It will just change the way that my book looks within the chapters. So if you go into the chapter itself, you'll see that it looks a little bit different than it did before and the, and the text and the typeface and the sizes are a little bit different. Um, so there you go. These are some ways in which you can change the appearance of your book. And you can really have a look to see uh, what you'd like. In theme options, you'll also have different different options for, for specific outputs as well. So if you were to, in, in PDF options, you will get you know options to change your page margins, uh, which you wouldn't have to do for ebook or webbook, which are, which are more responsive uh, formats of reading. So if you're interested, you can go and have a look at those there. And then the last thing that I wanted to talk about is obviously let's say that um, <laughs> this isn't a demo book and this is a real book and you know, you're ready to distribute this to your class. To export, all you have to do is choose the formats in which you'd like to export. You can export as many times as possible and just click on those and click export your book. Um, and you should be able to have your beautiful book that is uh, ready to be read with no additional effort. You don't have to format separately for PDF or for EPUB. Um, you just have to download them and they will be all automatically, sorry, ready for you to read and engage with. Um, I was really debating whether or not I should press export because I know, know it was going to take a second. <laughs> but I wanted to show you the example of what the PDF looks like so you know that um, I'm not lying. <laughs> so from here, I'm just going to download the PDF. And you can see that as I expect with the digital PDF, um, my everything is linked as I expect it to be linked. But ultimately, this is um, a um, Ultimately, this is a PDF, so it, lo it looks like it looks like what you would expect by PDF. It will print out like this, um, and you can distribute it to your liking. And the last thing is you can also put this on your home page. So in settings and under sharing and privacy, click yes. I would like the latest export files to be shared on the home page for free to everyone. What you'll see is that under here, you'll see download this book. And now your students don't have to email you to 
get a copy of this book in proper PDF, they can do this directly from the web book. So from this web book, you'll see that now, not only can you read this online, which it is compatible in browser with your laptop, iPad, tablet, or phone, you can also see that, uh, in, you can also download this, you know, if a student likes to read on their long commute to school, they'd be able to download this in the formats that are available to them and, and access it from, from all over the place. So I did run four minutes over time, but I hope that this was a helpful overview. So does anyone have any questions in the last five minutes of the session? Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Amy, I was wondering if you might be able to speak to the experience of a student that might print the book and what it's like with these interactive activities that we've seen earlier today, like with H5P, how does that unfold? Yeah, that's a really great question. Actually, seeing as I just put in an H5P activity and then I exported it, um, I'll show you here. So what this will do is this will give you, uh, as you're reading, it will say that obviously PDFs being a static format, you cannot, <laughs> it's not web-based. You won't be able to, you know, click on a YouTube video that is universal. Um, it will give you this little box that just says, this interactive element has been excluded from this version of the text, this version being PDF, and it will give you a link. Um, and I believe it should lead you to, to the activity itself. Um, okay, so I don't know why it's not doing that. There you go. So you'll see that when you go to the link itself, it will take you directly to the activity. I don't actually think, oh, there you go. Yeah, it was the YouTube video, not the HYFP activity. So um, you can see here that it will open the, it will open the web book and take you directly to where that place, uh, where the interactive, interactive activity is in the book. Sorry, that's a mouthful. <laughs> oh, Kathy, that is an amazing idea. Oh my goodness, I'm so surprised I've never thought of that before. You could, I think you probably could do that. Absolutely. I've, and, yeah. I've done some that I include in the web version too, but I need to, I need to read y'all's stuff and see how to do stuff only in the PDF copy so that, that the QR code doesn't show everywhere. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a really good um that's a, that's a really smart idea. I think if you also um there should be a way to do that. I'm not directly on Pressbooks, but you probably could do that uh, using CSS. So it requires some amount of wizardry, but definitely definitely possible. Um great idea. I'll definitely um have to suggest that to <laughs> to people in the future. Thanks for suggesting that, Kathy. Um Ali asked a question that says someone revises a press book, does it show the versions or do, do you overwrite and the other one is gone? So Ali, I just uh, showed that um, in my chapter here, I'll be sharing my screen because this is quite an important point. Um, on here, if you go into edit, uh, if you go into browse, anyone who creates edits, it will show, um, it will show the revisions of all of the different people who are working on the book. So it will show, um, you can see this, this edit was made by me. Um, Obviously, I input in all of this information, but let's say Jocelyn, this is Jocelyn's book. If Jocelyn went on here and made edits, then you would see it says edits made by Jocelyn. Here are the things that she removed and here are the things that she added. Um, and you should be able to see that revision history from there. Will the user see it? No. Oh, sorry. Meaning the user version, you, read it, you are reading the third person. So we do have a feature called enable. So, okay, so let me just reread that question from the perspective of a user. If someone revises a press book, does it show the versions? Um, no, yeah, no, you would not be able to see the different versions. You would have to create, so that's obviously a, a, um, a micro versioning. So if you change the chapter in different iterations, that is different. But I do know that there are authors who will, if there is a substantial enough of a version change, they'll release different versions of the book. So. Um, yeah, which is, I'm sure, something that you've already thought too. Um, would we say in the book, the second edition of this version? Uh, yes, yeah, totally. I think there are, if you go on the directory, actually, you should be able to see books that have done that, you know, second ed, third ed, you know, different different options. And, and yeah. Yeah, if I may, Ali, the, the philosophy book that I've been working on for several years now, we're on our fourth edition. And so what I do each, each time we publish, I, I name it the 
the fourth edition, and then I date, I put a pub date in there, and then I do, I redo the export files so that the export files now reflect the new version of the book. But I also, each time I save that XML file so that I have a version of, of one, two, and three, they're just, they would just have to be pulled back in to be rendered. Does that make sense? Thank you. Well, I think that we all learned quite a bit about press books here in the last 50 minutes. So I want to thank Jocelyn and Amy for coming and giving us that overview. And um, guys, please reach out to them or reach out to Brad or me or Brittany if you have any questions, if you're interested in learning more. And thank you so much for the presentation today. Thank you so much for the kind words, Tracy, and um, and for and, and Brad. Thank you for uh, thank you for inviting us to to be a part of this presentation. And thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for for coming. I hope that this was my, my our goal always is to uh, sort of lower the barrier for you getting started. So um, I hope that this has been helpful for that. Jocelyn, do you have any last words? <laughs> uh, just thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, this was fun. Thank you, Amy. And Jocelyn, it was really nice to get to meet you as well. We've worked with Amy for the last couple of years now on our Pressbooks network, but I'm really happy to see that we have more hands on deck. So I'm sure we'll be seeing you at the next Pressbooks publishing webinars. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I'm happy. We're, yeah, We're very happy to have her here as well. So um, yes, many, we love a growing team. <laughs> well, we'll see everybody else at our next session at two o'clock. <laughs>